Okay, welcome to this wood carving demonstration. Uh, today we're going to make a wooden eating spoon, like this, just a very simple one. Um, you will need a piece of wood. This is birch. Um, lime is also a good one. Uh, what I've done here is I've taken a branch and I've sawn it and split it down the middle. Um, you need something with a straight grain. You don't want lots of knots in it. And yeah, they're probably the ones to go for. Birch is particularly good, it's quite hard. Uh, lime is softer. But birch will make for a better spoon. To carve out the bowl, we use a gouge like this. Curved chisel. You gouge, you want the old the older tools are better, the steel is harder. So you can get them sharper. Sharper tools are safer tools as well. Um, you can buy these on the internet or find them in people's garages and that kind of thing. I've got a Maracno whittling knife. Also carbon steel is what you're looking for. Maracno is a good brand, made in Sweden. You need a saw, any kind of saw. A mallet and a vice to work from. That's it. So we'll begin by carving the bowl of the spoon. Okay, so I've got my design drawn on here. And I'm going to sit this in the vise. Nice and tight. I'll take my gouge. First thing I want to do is make sure I'm close to the work with my body and um, just become conscious of my body. I need to feel sturdy, stable, balanced, and kind of grounded. Get into a position that feels comfortable and gives me strength. For the gouge, my palm's on the back of it, that's really driving it. This hand is going to control it, pivot it, twist, this kind of thing, and hold it back, ultimately. It's all about finding a controlled way to carve. You don't want to feel like you're just forcing it and then it can just fly out. You need to know that you've got control of the chisel. So my palm is on the work and the grain is going this way I'm going to carve across the grain against the grain and I'll just kind of dive in to do this start by making very small cuts from the outside of your design towards the centre can move round the circle to a certain degree but I don't want to go directly with the grain because it can lift pieces up like that so going against the grain means I can make a really clean cut and I'm putting a little, a little twist in there too to help slice the wood slice the fibres So I can start to lift out this side from down here. I don't even have to flip the work, but also equally you can and do the same as we've done here on that side. Here I have to be mindful of what the grain's doing as I start to work on this wall. Um, there are directions really. You want to work from 
south to east, north to east, south to west, north to west. This is because, now that I've created this angle here, the fibres of the wood are getting longer as they come up here, so if I cut that way, each fibre is supported by the one behind. Whereas if I carve towards it into the grain, um, and come towards unsupported fibres, and it's just going to dig in, pair it up, tear it. So I'll work in this direction, and stop in the middle. start to bunch up like that, and then come the other way. And cut that out. Go. Can be tricky at the bottom. the different slopes are kind of meeting. You have to get more delicate as you get down there, more gentle. So what I'm going to do now is kind of hatch, hatch the spoon out of its shell. The spoon's already in there now. It exists within the wood. So we just kind of have to crack it out. And there's quite a quick way you can do this. By using the grain, kind of using working, using the grain against itself in a way. So I'm going to saw down these stop cuts, and then I'm going to come in from the side with my gouge and just knock big pieces off like that. So just keep your saw nice and balanced. You don't want to cut into the vise. Maybe I'll begin halfway down to be safe and we'll see what happens because if the grain is doing a little jumps down or something I can start here and it will end up down there. Uh, if it's going up I'll start here and it'll end up up here but since I think it's quite straight it should go, it should line up about from where I begin. There we go. Okay, looks good. Okay, quite close to the line there, so I don't think I can go any further. Now I'm going to leave this one in for a moment. So it'll make a nice wall for me to work against when I carve down here. So I'm line up here to move what's on the, the excess beyond the bowl. Okay, nice and close there. Good. Now here I could use the mallet, but um, I prefer to carve it. It feels nicer. And we're just going to go down here. Cut around the outside of the bolt. Close, so I think I'll just knock this one out. So. Being gentle as I approach the bowl, I don't want to fly through. So for this little corner here, this would be quite hard with a knife, so I'm going to do it with the gouge. As there's so many fibres running down here, when you cut along the surface you're usually just getting a small amount of them, but when you have to cut down an angle like that, 
you have to slice through a lot of fiber so um, it's very hard um, so we've got to bear in mind the direction here so um, coming down this way the fibers are supported by the ones underneath them and it will, it will, it will cut well if I come up this way I would be digging in and it would kind of break off like that coming down this way I'm going to clean cut the whole way need to just keep checking over the side and make sure I'm not hitting the bowl Did that example? I put a big split in it. And there's more there. All right, nice. Will be next video will be how to repair a broken spoon. I think. I'll have to work with this. See, there's a crack running through here, which has started it all. It can be disappointing that kind of thing. You don't know what's in the wood until you get in there. And you just gotta work with it. Let's see if it can be see if it can be saved. Like a different kind of spoon or Yeah, or generally in carving you can just lower everything further down. But what I want to do here is just find out how deep this crack goes. Still here. This is a fairly bad injury. I think I'd like to continue and see what we can do with it. I guess people doing their own work are likely to run into mistakes like this too, so it's a good opportunity. Wood's very unpredictable, there's a lot of risk with it. But yeah, so it's uh, comes a matter of whether to work with it or to scrap it and start again. I'm going to try and work with it, I think. Okay. So the back is now nice and thin. So I'm just In. It would be safer for the piece to put stop cuts in. But this grain's very straight, I feel confident that I can just take this off. Shape the bowl a bit here too. Just by kind of lowering each side. So, I think this is ready to move on to whittling. Well, I may just want to have a quick look at this first. And what I've probably got to do is just lower the whole thing. So let's start by. So I'm just kind of bringing it back a bit.
So I'm lowering the whole bowl a bit now. Because I'm going to have to lower the whole rim too. What I'm doing really is just reducing everything. Um, lowering the face of it down. And the outside. in order to kind of recede back to the point where the, the split uh, isn't there. Now I'm kind of bringing the bowl back close to the handle to make up for what we've lost here. Okay, I think for the minute this will do. It's not a bad fix up, considering I thought it might have to be scrapped, but yeah. Just shows it's worth it's worth trying, I think. This looks okay, it won't be quite as good as it would have been, but it's it's gonna work. Okay, so I've managed to save the spoon. I've basically uh, cut off the injury, you might say. So I've reduced this end of the bowl, and then I've just brought it back a bit, carved more out here so that it's still round. And uh, now we're on to the knife work. So I've got my whittling knife, I'm wearing an apron. It's because I like to work a lot with the draw cut. So it's holding the spoon like this, in this point, I don't know what you call that, but it's kind of on the breastplate. And you have uh, the knife held like this, thumbs on the side of the blade, like that. <clears throat> and what I'm going to go for is like these corners, these ridges, they're a lot easier to kind of... Um, grip the wood because there's less to work with if you just go on the flat you've got a lot to cut so go on the angles it applies for yeah, lots of cuts okay so I'm going to bring it towards myself but I'm kind of stopping as soon as my uh, 
the bottom of my fist hits my chest really so the knife is still quite far away um, yeah doesn't look as safe you, it's kind of a matter of if, if you feel confident doing this then work with it if not if it scares you then don't but uh, yeah I think it's the only it's the only cut I do which I've never got cut doing so uh, I'll vouch for its safety it's very satisfying as well you can get a lot of work done very quickly especially when you're working with something like this with a handle another way to do it is put one end in a vise or something like that and use a spoke shave When it bunches up like that, but I don't want to remove it all the way because saying I might want a little flare up here. We do is, but I can tell you know if I keep going in now, it's just going to remove more and more. So I'm going to stop that by coming in behind it. Just release it. Okay, so I need to keep zooming out and checking the spoon. How's the shape looking? How symmetrical is it? Bunching up again. Let's release it. And so the second cut I'm using that you're seeing a little bit. <clears throat> this is the main whittling cut, this is the push cut. So you have one thumb behind the blade, and then this thumb goes behind that thumb. Cross it over the wood and push like this. It can feel a bit uncomfortable to begin with. I usually notice with students, maybe 15 or 20 minutes, it will start to look natural and they'll get comfortable with it. It's a really good way to carve. Other people will put a thumb on the back of the blade. Like this, this can work too. More for delicate stuff though. The detail cut is thumb right on the end. And this is good for coming down uh, this part of the bowl where you join it to the handle. Because there's a little twist there. Using this part is probably it's too much of the blade to turn that corner. If you're working with the grain, you're basically carving downhill. So you could consider this here a high point, so you carve down to here. High point down to here. High point down to here. That's to be with the grain. You'll notice if you're not with the grain, the wood will tell you, the wood's the teacher really, it will say, nope, nope, that's the wrong direction. And then, uh, It'll tear, or bunch up, or dig in, whatever, chip off. And uh, yeah, so the main thing with whittling as well is that you're just keeping all of your fingers, when you're doing this push cut, your hand and your fingers are always behind the blade. So it's coming away from you like this. But, uh, never towards you like that. Obvious, really. Your thoughts get quieter. You're running in a sort of intuitive way. Not really thinking how to do it, but just responding to what's there almost automatically. It has a really relaxing effect, I think. Just a nice place to be, nice state of mind to be in. Nice material to spend time with. 
it's just all becomes it's just its own world you know this interaction between the blade and the and the wood and something that's just so it's just such a natural material it feels like connecting with nature when I carve because it is nature I'm nature too I suppose you know. but uh, yeah it's it's an instinctive thing to do I think yeah just pick up a piece of wood and start stripping the bark off and cutting it away and almost kind of destroying enough of it until it becomes something you want something useful and something beautiful or something you can give away and I like that um, that point in humanity where everything's changing really quickly probably the most defining aspect of this society really has changed that you can do things like this which haven't changed for thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands of years, it's always been the same. And people have always done it the same way, really. I think, yeah, the more we have AI and things developing, there's more of a need for this kind of thing as a, as a remedy for that. To balance it out. So tricky grip here, um, but yes, yeah, so if you can see what I'm doing there, two fingers over and the thumb over, like that. So I've got this space here to carve down towards the handle. Spoon. Now I'll do the front side. So it's almost like working in quarters, like that. You've got, you work here, you work here, you work here, and you work here, quarters. So. Checking the thickness like this. Don't want to go too much further here, it feels quite thin already. I think this is ready for sanding. I could probably do a little bit more. I often like to finish them just with a blade. Um, if you can, if you can, it's a good way to do it. Because um, the blade burnishes the wood and makes actually for a really good finish. Whereas if you sand it, you kind of, you know, you tear up a lot of the grain. Um, and uh, although you would notice because it's so smooth, the surface isn't quite as um, clean in a way. So when it gets water on it, it can go a little bit fluffy. Um, but I usually sand anyway, and something you can do is you can sand it and you can get it wet so it goes fluffy, and then you can sand it again. And then it's kind of good to go. But even if it does get fluffy, it's okay. It reduces eventually the more you use it. And the more you use it, the better it looks. It kind of takes on a whole new finish, really. They usually get darker. You can also cook your spoons as well, if you want to have a bit of a burned look to it.
Okay. And that's ready for sanding. Okay, so I've given this a rough sanding now. And uh, yeah, I think I'm going to leave it here. Left the back faceted on the back of the bowl, but the handle is all sanded, and inside the bowl is sanded. You sand with the grain, and you can start use multiple grits of sandpaper. So it starts coarse and then gets finer. And then once I've done that, I'll um, apply a finish. That would be raw linseed oil or walnut oil, and there's some others too, but something that's food safe. It's a raw linseed oil, not boiled raw. Um, so that's it. Other designs I do, uh, put a little S in it, S shape like that, put some shape into it. And maybe give it an extra pinch here and put a pattern on, something like that. Also has the shape. Um, and I also make other things. I take commissions like this. And I make a lot of these at the moment. These are all things I sell on the internet, on Facebook, TJ Woodcarving. Um, there'll be a link, I guess, in this video. And, uh, yeah, so just let me know if you want any help or guidance. Um, you may want to begin by getting a spoon blank if you don't want to try and find your own wood. Um, I have a lot of birch and lime here, and I do sell wood to people or prepare spoon blanks for them if they need that. And I can give advice and guidance. Um, and the, the birch and the lime I have have all come to me uh, through Michael Gibson, who works for the council and gets it from the park. So it's very local wood, it's from Caldicott Park. Um, yeah. So, uh, yes. Yeah, I may even be able to take you back to the spot where the tree was growing and say, this is, this is where your spoon grew. Yeah. So, uh, please get in touch with me for that. Thanks for watching the video. Thanks to the gallery for hosting it. And, uh, yeah, thanks a lot. Take care.